Welcome, everybody. Greetings to everybody in the room and to everybody watching us on the web. My name is David Sandalo. I'm the inaugural fellow here at Columbia's Center on Global Energy Policy, and I am thrilled to welcome to Columbia today David Crane, the CEO of NRG. Uh, let me uh, just start with a uh, commercial announcement for those of you who are following us uh, both here in the room and on the web. We have a number of upcoming events. Um, on November 16th, um, we have an event on Decoding Paris. Um, on November 20th, uh, we have a conversation with Adam Siminski, the EIA Administrator on the U.S. Energy Outlook. On November 30th, um, we have an event on Venezuelan um, elections and their impact on energy. And on, no on December 1st, uh, we are welcoming Fatih Birol, um, the uh, head of the International Energy Agency, for a discussion on the world uh, energy outlook um, under the leadership of our Founding director, uh, Jason Bordoff, we have got quite a series of events and research on our website. Please visit, uh, please visit, visit us at energy, uh, uh, energypolicy.columbia.edu. Um, uh, and uh, Jason is walking in the room a moment after I recognize him. So thank you, Jason, for all your leadership at the Center on Global Energy Policy. Um, when David Crane um, became president and CEO of Energy in 2003, the company was a regional wholesale generation business. Today, it is a national Fortune 200 diversified energy company. Under David's leadership, NRG has grown to become the nation's largest competitive power generator with enough generating capacity to power nearly one third of the US population. The company is also a, a major competitive energy retailer that serves nearly three million retail customers as one of the country's largest owners and operators of solar power facilities. David's one of the leading voices in the power industry on the topic of climate change and the need for curbing carbon emissions, and he was one of the first U.S. power industry CEOs to publicly call for mandatory climate change measures. Prior to joining NRG, David served as CEO of International Power PLC, a U.K.-based wholesale power generation company. Previously, he held positions at Lehman Brothers uh, and ABB Energy Ventures in Sydney, Hong Kong, where I was yesterday, and New York. Um, David is a graduate of Harvard Law School and Princeton College. He's overcome that handicap to go on to a very successful career. Um, uh, please join me in welcoming to the stage David Crane. Thanks for being with us, David. Now, I'm going to ask David some questions. Uh, and then uh, you, uh, everybody in the room, you have uh, cards on your seat. Please pass up cards with questions if you have them. Um, and if you're watching us on the web, you can uh, send in your questions on Twitter um, at CGEP events, hashtag CGEP events, Center on Global Energy Policy Events. Um, so David, thanks again for joining us here at Columbia. Uh, great to see you. I'm a longtime admirer of David. It's really fun to be here uh, with him. Um, let's just start really big picture, David. Um, people say that the utility industry is essentially unchanged for the past 100 years, that if Thomas Edison came back today, he would recognize much of what he sees but that the next several decades are going to be a period of major change. Do you agree with that assessment? And what do you see as the major forces shaping the utility industry today? Well, I mean, I, I agree uh, completely with that assessment that uh, I, I think that the, uh, the power industry um, in the United States has probably changed less than any other industry over the last 100 years or um, uh, in terms of the technology and everything. But rather than focus on the past, I, I think the way to think about it, the way I think about it is it, I mean, is it, and thinking about it from a very American perspective, uh, is, is it really logical that we're going to build a 21st century economy and society based on 120 million wooden poles? Um, and when you have an energy delivery system like we have in the United States, that it's only as good as its weakest link. And, uh, and in a, and I think, it, I think we're into an era of climate adaptation. And, uh, and we, we don't have a system that's physically capable of handling, the, I think, the weather challenges of the 21st century. And the system we have also, you know, while people generally don't like to talk about it, is probably the greatest national security risk that we have. Um, and because we become more and more dependent on electricity in terms of everything we do. And I think if people in the room like, like I did live through Superstorm Sandy. You see how vulnerable you are. I mean, it's not like 20 or 30 years ago where, oh, God, the lights are going to go out because a big storm's coming. All you had to worry about was you know, uh, finding some alternative source of light. 
now your entire universe of connectivity and everything depends on electricity. So, so it's an important national uh, strategic issue and from an industry issue. I think the delivery system uh, is hopelessly obsolete. You know, a lot of people focus on how we change the generation mix to address the problem of climate change. I want to get to that, but you've just raised a very interesting issue, which a lot of people here live through, which is the vulnerability of the power system um, to, to climate change. Can you just elaborate on that? How do we make the, the uh, power system more resilient to what's coming in terms of climate change? Well, I, I think that if you listen to the utilities that own uh, the transmission and distribution system, they would say spend more money on the transmission and distribution system, which, you know, in, in which if you're a monopoly and you get paid based on the amount of money you spend, um, that's, that's what you do. Um, I think, and, and don't quote me on these statistics because you know, I'm going from memory, the, I, I think PSE&G, which you know, the, the dominant utility in New Jersey, um, after Superstorm Sandy, uh, and I have to say as a PSE&G customer, as utilities go, they do a great job. But they announced a plan to sort of uh, reduce, mitigate the impacts of future Superstorm Sandys. And they said something like, if we spend five to $10 billion hardening you know, our substations and things like that, instead of the two million homes that were out during Superstorm Sandy, we could get that number down to 900,000. And, and I'm like, well, do I want to pay for that five to ten billion dollar upgrade? Well, you tell me whether I'm one of the one point one million that got saved or the nine hundred thousand that are screwed anyway. <laughs> so, uh, so I mean, that's what they would tell you to do. What I would tell you to do is, I think that uh, it's an inev it's inevitable in an age of affordable uh, solar power that solar, which is the one uh, t generation technology we have in, in, in our space, which actually downsizes economically, is that uh, people are going to start harnessing the solar value of their home. It's, you know, if you own property and you have sun shining on your property, that's, you know, that's a property right. And people are going to do more and more of that as they've shown they've already started to do. And that's going to lead to a more distributed system and the way I think about it is that if you think about the computer, the way computers have evolved, you know, originally in the 70s and uh, uh, 80s, there were just a few of these massive supercomputers. And then the personal computer comes along. And of course, there are the famous statements that some people made. I think uh, Tom Watson at IBM said, why would anyone want a personal computer in their home? Or, or maybe his quote was, there'll never be more than 10 computers. You know, you know, they had those statements. But if you look at the way the computer networking went, it went from sort of a centralized, giant, supercomputer-based system. Then everyone put the PCs uh, out there you know, for someone's home use, personal use. And then people started a way to, found a way to string the PCs together. And then the supercomputers weren't necessary anymore. And, and, and they just found out that the computing power of coordinating all these personal computers, small computers, and then working it into the cloud, that was the future. I, I see a progression a little bit like that in our space. And, and believe me, the one thing I always get in trouble with is I don't focus enough on how long it'll take. I mean, this isn't going to happen overnight. But I mean, we get a situation where uh, there's a lot of talk about microgrids. I don't think microgrids generally get imposed from the top. I think they grow up or organically. Uh, you'll get more and more people may, uh, and businesses, mainly businesses, providing for their own electricity uses because uh, they need more resilience, more reliability than the grid provides them. And then they'll realize that they have spare capacity. And if we've learned one thing about the 21st century economy and all the high tech, uh, whether you're talking about Airbnb or any of these businesses, wherever there's spare capacity in our society going forward, society is going to find a way to use that spare capacity. And so we're in the very early stages of this, but I think distributed power will have spare capacity built in, and people start stringing that together, and that's how microgrids will grow up. And it'll be a very solar-driven uh, system. Is, is that spare capacity storage? Well, other, I, are there other tools that we're going well, to Well, I mean, uh, you know, storage is the, is the, you know, whether you're talking about big renewables or, or distributed renewables, uh, storage, or even, I would say, the centralized system. I mean, storage uh, has always been the holy grail of the American power sector. I, I got involved in the American power industry, or I should say the global power industry, 
about 25, 20 years ago. And the breakthrough in battery storage uh, uh, was, was always two years, was two years away back in 1990. And it, you know, it's still two mm -hmm. years away now. And so um, I'm really hoping for an energy storage solution, but I've been hoping for an energy sto storage solution for, my, uh, for the 25 years I've been in the industry. So there, there's certainly very positive signs now in terms of where you see the cost of energy storage getting to, but keep in mind that the thing that is grinding down the whole energy sector is that you know, we live in a world right now, or at least in a country, of complete energy abundance. Uh, and we are having trouble adjusting to that as an industry. I mean, it's great for the American consumer if the savings are passed through to them, which in a lot of cases they're not. Uh, but, but as an industry, if, if basically uh, all forms of energy are getting close to being free, um, then it's, you know, it's obviously difficult to innovate and try new things. One of the abundant resources we have here in the United States is natural gas. It's been an incredible explosion in natural gas and a lot more of that coming on to the, to the grid. Um, what do you see the future of natural gas in the, in the power sector? Well, I mean, this, I mean, I'm a big, I mean, as a running a company, I mean, I, of course, for as little regulation as possible, and I'm a capitalist and, and all that. Uh, but um, the, the future of natural gas, I think, is, is pivotal in the sense that if you're, you know, I mean, you find environmentalists like just hopelessly conflicted, you know, on this, right? Because they hate fracking. But if natural gas is uh, replacing coal, then they like it. But then they worry if it's, I mean, we, we cannot serve, I mean, we do not want an all natural gas world, right? I mean, if, if you do that, I mean, I, you know, I don't do these projections myself, but uh, um, I sat through an, an industrial, uh, uh, a big Euro European company that'll remain nameless had done a, a, you know, a long-term model on what they called it, they called it the all gas all the time you know, model, and I think they, they, they said if, you know, you get rid of all the coal, replace it with gas, you know, carbon emissions go down, but as we all know, if the world scientists tell us we gotta get down by 80%, you know, splitting your carbon, you know, I didn't get past sixth grade math. <laughs> you know, I, I know replacing coal with natural gas doesn't get you down 80%, it gets you down 50%. Uh, and, um, and this model showed that it would be about a four degree centigrade uh, increase, and you probably know other models like that, but I don't think there's anyone that's saying, okay, fine, just get rid of the coal, do gas, and we're done. Uh, it doesn't work. And also, I would say from an industry perspective, the way I think about the energy industry in the United States is you have uh, two uh, virtually parallel uh, energy delivery systems in the United States, each of which I think coincidentally you know, represents about a trillion dollar investment. You know, you've got the one that starts with fossil fuel, and you know, then it's transported either through pipelines or in rail cars to power plants and high voltage transmission lines distribution, provides energy into the house. Trillion dollars right there. Then you have another trillion dollars that's, uh, you know, uh, you know, oil, uh, you know, that pumps oil out of the ground, uh, takes it to refineries, puts it into pipelines, takes it to gas stations, puts it in a car. So you have trillion dollars there. And they're very, uh, they're parallel systems. Uh, or when I, you know, when, in the, you know, young people don't drive like we drove back in the day, but when you turn 16 in the 1970s, the first, on your 16th, I mean, this country, the United States, uh, you know, the, the defining experience of my youth, uh, or when I, you know, when, in the, you know, young people don't drive like we drove back in the day, but when you turned 16 in the 1970s, the first, on your 16th birthday, you got your driver's license, right? That was freedom back then. You know, I got my driver's license, you know, in the middle of one of the oil crises, you know, where Me the too. line, <laughs> and, uh, you know, our country's, uh, uh, you know, for 40 years, the, you know, the greatest vulnerability of the United States has been in terms of our dependence on foreign oil. We never really did anything you know, about it until, you know, we just sort of gotten lucky in terms of our uh, domestic. But everyone in the electric industry, and this is one area where I'm completely aligned with the people, because then we're just in the same, you know, we have a transportation industry that's completely dependent on one fuel, and then the electricity industry becomes completely dependent on natural gas. People who run big utilities, and there's not too many things I'm aligned with them on. No one wants to see the electric side of thing become one fuel. 
because then we're just in the same, you know, we have a transportation industry that's completely dependent on one fuel, and then the electricity industry becomes completely dependent on natural gas. Because the shocking thing that is happening right now is that, um, and I thought in the, I, I don't, you know, I should say some Obama administration veteran that you are, <laughs> but uh, um, right now natural gas is displacing uh, coal. And, and, and again, environmentalists love that. The carbon emissions of the country go down. It's not really because of environmental policy. It's because coal plants can't compete with natural gas at this price level. Um, and then you set goals that we think we can attain by 2030, but then what they don't tell you is that on the current trajectory, then carbon emissions uh, get worse from 2030 to 2050, because come 2030, gas isn't displacing coal anymore. It's displacing nuclear. And then you're, and then you're going in the wrong direction. Uh, but what's happening right now, <laughs> I mean, shocking as it is, is that the price of natural gas has become so low that nuclear plants are closing right now. And, uh, and, you know, again, I'm sure there are a lot of environmentalists in the room that hate nuclear. You know, I'm a, I'm a pro, I like to think of myself as a pro-nuclear. I don't think there's any future for nuclear in the United States. Uh, but if, if, if we really set ourselves at, if you want to have a centralized grid and you want to do something about climate change, I think you have to have nuclear in the mix. I don't think it's a practical possibility now. But... But seeing the existing nuclear plants in the United States, you know, fully paid for plants uh, in terms of their capital costs being shut down because they're competing for a wholesale price of electricity, which can't even cover their operating costs. Uh, that's, that's, you know, that's a move in the wrong direction. So, so I think what you need, and I don't know exactly what the policies are, David, I'm sure you've thought about this much more than I have, is that, um, if you can actually use natural gas as a bridge fuel, if you can use it as is being done in California to support a 50% renewable market, I mean, we ourselves are building fast start gas plants that are specifically designed that they can come online in 10 minutes because, you know, the big issue, uh, as I think a lot of people in the room know in California, is because of the complete influx of solar power, the system now strains at 6 o'clock at night as opposed to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, when the sun goes down, suddenly all the fossil plants have to scramble and come online because the solar plants are dropping off uh, so rapidly at that hour. Uh, so you need fast start. So uh, gas has its place, but I think it has to be managed uh, in a way that maybe it's not yet being done. For those who are listening by, po by podcast, I'm David Sandel, the uh, inaugural fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy. I'm here with David Crane, the CEO of NRG. We have an all-David panel today. Uh, <laughs> David, um, let's, we, we've touched on, on solar and gas and nuclear. We haven't talked about coal yet. What are your thoughts on the future of coal in the generation mix? Well, I, I think that, um, you know, again, I, maybe I'm in, a, in a, this middle path. I mean, clearly, I think uh, coal, coal that emits carbon in the atmosphere, uh, you know, is, is basically on its last legs in the United States, which is... Again, if you care about global warming, yeah, it's a big distinction. Uh, I don't think there's been a new coal plant started in the country in the last five or six years. I, I, you know, as a, a person who's, you know, my main job as uh, running a power company where I basically, you know, I don't know the difference between a volt and an amp. Uh, you know, my job is capital allocation, uh, you know, making decisions on what we uh, build next. Uh, and I have to say, and again, I'm, I think I'm lockstep with utility executives. You'd have to have your head examined as an industry person right now to try and build a new coal plant in the United States, one that emits carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, so um, what I would say is that, um, you know, my formula for dealing with climate change, uh, you know, everyone's like, oh, it's so complicated and it's, so, it's such a big problem and what can we do? And, you know, a lot of people get very fatalistic. I, I don't think it's all that complicated. Yeah, I think, I think you, uh, you got to do five things, four of which we can affect. The fifth one, which has to do with deforestation and, you know, uh, responsible agriculture. You know, leave that to Paul Pullman at Unilever. Uh, but, but the other four um, is we, we, have to, we, have to, um, we have to figure out carbon capture and either sequestration or turning it into something in the absence of a price of uh, carbon that society will value. In fact, NRG 
announced uh, last month that we're sponsoring a, a carbon X Prize uh, through the X Prize Foundation. And, and the idea of that is not just to figure out the person who's most economically can capture the carbon, but since you know a lot of us are skeptics about society actually putting a price on carbon, turning it into something that society will pay for. Because you know the capitalist system solves for things that they get paid to do. <laughs> so, and you know, from an industry person, if I can turn carbon emissions, which is currently the greatest liability risk that NRG faces, from a liability or a risk into an asset, you know, I've done a wonderful thing for NRG shareholders. So, I mean, so we have to do it, even if there are not going to be any new coal plants in the United States, and all the focus on the clean power plan and all that, you know. To, to quote Bill Shakespeare, to me, it's sort of much ado about nothing because the average age of a coal plant in the United States right now is a r roughly 40 years old. Um, w if the EPA gets all over the coal plants and all that, you know, they may accelerate the pace at which they are retired by a couple years, but far more important than worrying about whether you know, coal plants get, go out of the system in 2020 as opposed to 2023 is what do we replace it with? Because that's what's going to affect getting down 80% by 2050. I would actually like to see coal as part of the mix in the United States for the point I made earlier, because I, I believe in diversity of fuel supply. But you need coal without putting carbon into the atmosphere. And so po post-combustion carbon capture is the most important, just to fill out my other, you know, solar everywhere all the time in terms of distributed solar making sure that the developing world doesn't follow our centralized system and then you know, clean transportation. I think you do those five things and you're in a good place. Uh, let's go back to solar for a minute. Does the grid have the ability to handle lots of solar coming on in terms of the variability of the resource? You know, this is one of those things where, I mean, the utilities who have a vested interest in making sure that solar doesn't happen unless they control, which there's no reason for them to control because they don't actually want to do it and they don't know what they're doing. Um, they, so they, one of the things they hide behind, apart from some specious unfairness arguments, is the idea that it destabilizes the grid. And when I started to hear that argument, which I think I first heard in Australia in about 1999 or 2000, the theory was if that there was a grid that had more than 20% intermittent renewables on it, it would be inherently unstable. That was the first place I heard it was in South Australia. Well, you know, the Germans have been operating in their shoulder season at certain times with 70 to 80 percent of the power in Germany being, uh, and as far as I can tell, they're doing fine. So, you know, the utilities, the people that control the grid, you know, tell you this stuff, but then they never back it up. And there's actually no empirical evidence that's actually true. But since, since it's a black box to all of us on the outside, and no one wants to see the grid go down, God knows no politician wants to see the grid go down, they get more credence than they should. Of course, David, that issue goes away completely if you have effective energy storage, right? Um, do capital markets know how to finance solar? Um, I, I, I think the capital markets have been very creative. Uh, I, I, well, let me put it this way. If you're talking about distributed solar or, well, even big, uh, that, that would, sort of lack of originality of the capital markets would not be high on my list of complaints about what's going on in the mm -hmm. industry. I think that there's been uh, a significant amount of creativity there uh, by the banks. Um, the only thing I would say that, uh, um, that's sort of unfortunate from a societal perspective, it's not the bank's fault, is that um, you know, the government decides to encourage uh, solar power and all. Uh, with, uh, you know, through the tax code. And uh, that's good. It's good. Uh, it's good to have some, you know, sort of government encouragement, you know, that lends itself financially. But, you know, you have this fundamental problem in society that the people who are most creative and the people who are doing the most disruptive things are usually not the ones that are sitting on, you know, $5 billion of profit. Because if you're making $5 billion doing something, you really aren't like waking up at six in the morning saying, damn, I need to do something different. Your main job in life is to keep making that $5 billion. And so the really creative companies and individuals that um, you know, are doing sort of the cutting edge stuff, you know, they have to find a way to monetize the, 
so, so much financial engineering goes into sort of getting the tax attributes into the right hands. And, and if you look at it overall, you just sort of look at these deals where there's lines and boxes in every direction. And, and you know, for a while, when like uh, right after the financial crisis, it seemed like the only person in the tax equity business was J.P. Morgan. I mean, J.P. Morgan ruled the clean energy world. Uh, I mean, there are more people now, so it's not quite as concentrated. Uh, but there's just a, you would think there's got to be a cleaner way, you know, of doing this. Uh, but but uh, look, I don't want to say anything bad about you know tax credits for for solar because I'm hoping that the 30% gets extended at the end of 2016. It's better than the alternative of zero. <laughs> so um, what do you think is the impact if it doesn't get extended? Well, I think what happens uh, um, for, if there's anyone in the room that doesn't know what we're talking about, is that the, it's the production tax credit, right? It's investment tax credit. Investment tax credit. I always get the PTC and that. So it's 30% for solar, and, and at the end of 2016, it drops down to 10%. And a lot of people think that that's a cataclysmic event. And certainly, you know, if you're in the industry, you'd prefer to have the 30%. And again, I hope that uh, there's some sort of grand energy compromise, and, and it gets extended at 30. But I think what's going to happen, uh, a couple things. First of all, the... Uh, the cost of the solar panels right now, um, uh, I, I buy a solar panel for roughly 60 cents a watt. By the time it gets on your roof, if you live somewhere in suburban America, it's $3.50. Um, so the solar panel itself, I think if you sort of break down that 350 into different buckets, the solar panel is about the fourth or fifth most important part of the price equation. An extraordinary amount of inefficiency, waste, and, and friction costs are in that 350. It's $2.20 in Germany because, you know, they start earlier, they've, they've cleaned up their system. And so, so um, I say that because our system will take those inefficiencies out. That's what capitalism does that very well. And so, you know, losing the going from 30 to 10 percent will make that up. I think what, hap what will happen, though, and is sort of affecting sort of the strategic rebalancing of the distributed solar industry right now is that no one really knows what the impact of that 30 to 10 percent uh, place is, and where there's uncertainty, people people sit on their hands, and that's mm -hmm. unfortunate. Uh, I actually think what you'll see is there's going to be you know if you're considering right now putting uh, solar, um, if you own a home, 2016 is your year. You know, I think there's going to be a, a massive surge of people. I mean, the sales volume, I think, in 2016 is going to go through the roof as people make sure they're on the right side of that 30 to 10 percent. Mm -hmm. And so I think that 2016 demand will steal some from 2017 demand. So there'll be a little drop off in 17. But I think within a, you know, a reasonable period of time, it'll bounce back. So one other question about solar finance. The yield co-market has taken a hit in the past couple of months. Any comments on that? Uh, well, the, the Yielco uh, market, um, you know, which is, is sort of the power industry equivalent of MLPs, you know, it's an income-based uh, company that, uh, that basically pays most of its uh, cash available for distribution. It, it, pays, um, it pays out in form of dividends. It's taken a huge hit in the last several months. Uh, and part of it is the industry's own, uh, you know, uh, mistakes. Uh, which, you know, comes with a young industry with investors who, in some cases, I think didn't really know. Um, it, you know, some investors thought this was an absolute risk-free um, investment, which it was merchant risk-free in the fact that the assets that are in the Yokos have long-term contracts, but it wasn't volumetric risk-free. I mean, when you, you know, uh, wind plants depend on the wind, solar plants depend on the sun shining. So part of it was just, I think, a, a growing pain for the industry. But also, and I, you know, I, I can see people in the room I know who know much more about the capital markets than I do. It's just it also represented a flight of money out of uh, income funds, and I don't actually know why because interest rates are still risk-free interest rates. Even if the Fed were to raise by 25 basis, but they're still near zero. And so you have these yield vehicles that now are sort of uh, throwing off five, seven, eight percent returns. It, it seems like, 
I, I don't know. It's, uh, it seems like some sort of economic dislocation that my father always used to say, don't defend the indefensible or try and explain something that you don't understand yourself. So maybe I'll just shut up right now. <laughs> so, uh, uh, if you're in the room and you have questions for David Crane, the CEO of NRG, please uh, send the cards down the aisle. And if you're watching us on the web, you can use hashtag CGEP events. Uh, and we'll ask questions uh, to David. Let's, uh, David. let's let's turn to another topic, which is um, utility regulatory models. You operate in lots of different states with lots of different models. Do you have any any comments? Uh, do do we have the regulatory models we need in the country today for the growth of this industry? Well, you know, um, which which part of the industry are you talking about? The, uh, well, the, the, well, let's start with um, distribution. And then yeah, retail, electric retail, distribution retail, electric or distribution. distributed. Uh, well, I, I think the uh, the issue that you have in it um, is sort of the the sort of utility death spiral uh, yeah. argument is that um, it seems to me that uh, you know big parts of the sort of sustainability movement are trying to find a way to get the the, the big utilities that do so well and have a protected monopoly. Uh, in their service territory to sort of embrace uh, renewable energy. And, and, the, and the people who run those utilities are smart enough not to sort of, uh, you know, sort of stiff arm that. Uh, but, but I think people, if you're interested in sustainability, climate change, you have to recognize that we're running out of time. And the utilities will say they want to do renewables, and they'll do a little bit of it, but there's nothing that we can offer them which is better than what they have now which is a complete monopoly. And so, and so then some, what I'm surprised in the utility world, and they just finished their big conference last week. And, they, and you know, the, the message that I heard came out of the conference was everyone wants to do, do regulate, everyone wants to hide between fortress, behind fortress monopoly walls. The thing is, if, if you actually empower people to provide their own electricity, that's beyond the scope, not only of the utility, because it's on the other side of the meter, but it's, 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 it's actually beyond the scope of the state regulator as well. And so um, it's, uh, you know, it's going to grow up organically. It's, uh, and to figure out a utility regulated model that sort of co-ops that, it doesn't make sense. I mean, the whole idea in a capitalist system based on competition is that you give someone a monopoly only where there is a natural monopoly, right? And there's, and there's, and there's a public interest in not having people duplicate uh, like a transmission system. Well, there is no natural monopoly in distributed generation, people making their own electricity. So, I, I, you know, I, I can't really answer, David, the question is, because it sounds sort of like you're saying, is there a way that we can allow these utilities to be so excited about their future in this distributed customer empowered world um, you know, can we, can we find that? I'm just like, no, because it can't, it's not better than what they've got now. Our customers that have no choice but have to, have to work with them. So obviously I'd like to see more competition. I mean, let me take California, for instance. Like, I mean, California, they're not, California's not going to allow Pacific Gas and Electric or Southern California Edison to try and co-opt the, you know, solar on the house. Thing. I mean, they've now got all these California companies, Solar City and Sunrun and all that, that are doing that fine without rate-based regulation. But there's still no retail competition in California. And like, I mean, that's sort of our business model is like, if I develop a relationship with you that causes you to trust me so much that you're going to allow me to put solar on your house um, and you're going to sign a 20-year lease, which is the dominant paradigm, and I sort of say, well, you know, I also provide grid power. So to the extent your solar panels aren't working, I mean, don't you want a seamless system? Like right now in New Jersey, where I live, if, if you put solar on your house from a company like us, you'll get this one bill that, it, and you'll, it, and, you know, and then you'll get your PSE and G bill. And you literally would have to go to Columbia and have a PhD from Columbia to figure out if you actually save money. You know, when the best thing, of course, for the customer is to provide it all. I mean, the customer just wants one seamless experience. I mean, that's what NRG has been trying to do in terms of, you know, being driven by renewable, but also to provide conventional where necessary. Sounds like a good research program for the Center on Global Energy Policy, David, so thank you. <laughs> okay, we have a first series of questions, and one of them, I'll just start with a real hardball here, David. David, you are a transformational leader. Um, <laughs> 
What top three and funny? <laughs> no, no. What top three lessons uh, would you like to impart about how to lead change in a large company? Well, you know, it's a good question. I was wondering because obviously, you know, David's too polite to ask the question. But I mean, you know, our company stock has, uh, you know, been under pressure like all other energy uh, stocks, and and you know, the the common thing to do is to criticize uh, the short termism, you know, of public markets. The the familiar uh, CEO refrain that, you know, I've got these investors, all they care about is next uh, quarter, quarterly earnings. You know, uh, I, I wouldn't want to whine like that. Uh, and it's, I, it's actually not something that I actually would criticize investors for, because I think, you know, uh, a long-term future is made up of a lot of quarters. So, you know, making money every quarter is a good thing. What I would say, though, that what we're being struck with is, um, you know, every company's uh, stock in our down, ours is actually down more than others, even though almost all of our investors will acknowledge that the things that NRG has done strategically over the last few years were exactly correct. I mean, the world is trending distributed. It's trending sustainable. It's trending uh, with commodity prices being, you know, in the gutter. As I, as I like to say internally, the value pendulum in the energy space has moved from the generation side to the retail side. You have to own the energy customer. That's where, that's where the future is, and that's what NRG, who starts as a power plant owner, has been trying to move the last five years. So we're in this surreal world where strategically no one is challenging us, but people say they hate it because it's too complicated. Uh, transformation is complicated. And that's, that's the conundrum we face. And, it's, and it starts, so it starts with external pressure. You know, when you're a public company, you are owned by those investors. You know, you have to be, to some degree, responsive to what they want. Then when it percolates into the company, David, the biggest challenge that we have internally is that question is, well, okay, if we have the right strategy, how come it's not being validated by the stock market? We actually are performing we are, we are as, we, as we round into the end of 2015, NRG is making pretty much precisely the amount of money in this year that we said we would make uh, in 2015, you know, in the middle of 2014. But then our stock was $37 a share, and now our stock is, you know, 13 or in that, in that area. You know, I'm reluctant to say it because I haven't checked the market this, this morning. So, uh, so dealing with that lack of external uh, validation is important, and I would say the second thing that's important is that um, you know the past always has more of a natural cons constituency in the human mind than the future. Uh, I think we uh, we've been. I mean, the type of people that have been recruited and have come to work at Energy in the last few years, you know, uh, you know, who believe in what Energy is trying to achieve, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, succeeding in a capitalist system, but helping affect societal change is great. But you know, that's a layer of people that have come in. There's a lot of people, particularly middle managers, you know, who, you know, who came to work to a company like NRG 20 years ago to work for a power company and not try and change anything, just have a safe income. So you, uh, you have these different strata in the company that you have to manage. And I would say the key to people who reflexively don't want to change is to show them the risk of standing still. And, um, and, that, and that, I think, is, if you think about it, if you look around society, and I, I actually, I, what I'm about to say, I didn't make up. I just heard Eric Schmidt from Google say it, and it made a lot of sense to me, is that um, because of the pace of change around our society, almost every company in every industry is facing some sort of existential challenge over the next five, 10 years. And it's amazing the number of companies that sort of ignore it. And in our space, I would say most people ignore it. And when they see someone like us who have sort of stood up to it, you know, get, you know, get, you know, sort of unval not validated by the market, it does, I don't think it's encouraging anyone else uh, to sort of look over the horizon either. What response have you had to the reorganization that you announced a couple months ago? Um, could you be a little more specific from? From, from who? From, 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 from internally, from, um, uh, from external stakeholders? Well, from external stakeholders, I would say that, I mean, the sell side analysts, the buy side, I mean, it, it pretty much, uh, it was pretty positive. I mean, there's always a, 
you know, sort of disappointment that, okay, you announced a strategic process with respect to part of your business. Well, well why aren't you announcing the outcome of it? <laughs> you know? And I'm like, well, you know, it takes, you know, to do it right, it takes, you know, some months. But in terms of the direction of it uh, from the investors, it was, uh, it was, it, it was, it's been good. I mean, one of the things that's been very strange about the market over the last few months is that almost anything you announce in the market even if it's something that is exactly what the market asks you to do, your stock will go down. So, I mean, it's one of the things we did, because, you know, and you probably don't have time to have a huge debate about the merits of share buybacks, but share buybacks, when stock prices are low, everyone wants them, particularly for cash flow generative companies like us. And, you know, we announced that plan in September 17th. I think like six days later, we announced a $250 million share buyback. And on the day we announced it, our stock went down 7% after we announced it, which was, you know, it was exactly what the market had asked for. So in some ways, uh, you know, the, when the market treats every announcement as a negative catalyst, uh, in some ways it's, it's, it's freeing because then you're just like, well, I, I, I'm not going to try and figure it out anymore. I'm just going to do the right thing. So that's, there's a little bit of, of that going on uh, right now. Um, you know, it's been more of a challenge internally, uh, David, because, uh, you, know, you know, the sort of facile way to think of a company like Energy is, oh, there are people that work on the conventional side and there are people that work on the green side. And, you know, if you're going to, you know, split it as we're sort of talking about doing for the people who don't know, uh, so that, and the goal of NRG right now is to try and maintain all the strategic logic of the two sides being together, but to give the, those two parts of the business different ownership because traditional NRG uh, attracts a value investor. The green part of NRG should invest a growth investor. And apparently in the investor world, never the twain shall meet. So, uh, but the idea is to keep the strategic logic together. And, and people, don't, people say, well, okay, so you have people working on the green side of the business. They go over there. People on the conventional side stay over there, and that's fine. It's easy. It's not so easy. I mean, if, you, know, um, you know, everyone at, you know, there are 11,000 people that work at NRG. But, I mean, I walk through the parking lot at coal-fired power plants at NRG, and I'll, I'll have, you know, you know, big, really scary-looking guys come up to me in the parking lot and sort of shake my hand and say, really appreciate where you're taking this company because it's important to my children. And so, you know, so I think we have extraordinary buy-in and, and, you know, and it's caused, I mean, quite a bit of agita, the idea that there, there could be some division going on. I have a question on a, another topic we haven't touched on, which is, I know, um, something dear to your heart, which is electric vehicles. Um, mm -hmm. And um, could you just say a word about how the transportation sector, which you spoke about as a trillion dollar industry, and the power sector, another trillion dollar industry, how they might come together uh, in the years ahead? Well, you know, we're trying, we have a thing uh, called EVgo. It's an electric vehicle charging network, has the most uh, level three chargers, you know, in, installed in the country right now. I just wanted to get that advertisement onto the uh, live stream uh, there. Um, so what I would say about electric vehicle charging is electric vehicles are coming, you know, uh, and the only question here is timing and what's the business model under which they, uh, electric vehicle charging network exists. Uh, you know, Tesla started to build their own chargers and they started to put them in places like the middle of Nebraska to demonstrate that if you wanted to, you could drive a Tesla car across the country. And, and you know, Tesla is a premium vehicle. They, you know, their range, in, I think, is 300 miles or thereabouts. It, that's a lot more than, you're paying a lot more. I mean, the average American car is driven 47 miles a day. Uh, that's why I think other pure electric cars like the LEAF goes for a 100-mile range, which is actually more of a 70-mile range, because if the average car is being driven 47 miles a day, you know, if, if, if you get over your, your range anxiety, you know, that should be enough, and the battery is expensive. But Tesla sort of thinks their, their customer base wants that, so they build chargers on Route 80, I-80 in the middle of Nebraska. Our approach is completely different. You know, we think that the first generation of electric uh, vehicles and charging uh, will be second cars. Uh, there are 300 million light duty vehicles in the United States right now, give or take a few tens of millions. 
and uh, 80 million uh, cars and uh, light trucks are second vehicles. You know, the, the car industry uh, turns over a vehicle in about 12 or 13 years, and so if you divide 80 by 12 or 13, that means if you're going after the second car market, the market's 6 million cars a year. That's a lot. Uh, you know, I think the total number of electric cars in the United States is still south of a million. But they're coming, and the only question is, why are they coming? And, and again, the business model. Uh, you know, uh, the CEO of Audi North America told me that by 2025, just to meet the CAFE standards, one out of every four cars that Audi sells in America will have to be a pure electric uh, car. And, uh, and so, um, so we're trying to get uh, the charging network out there that, that all the non-Tesla OEMs uh, use. Uh, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, I think it's going to be successful, but the question is when, um, because Right now, electric car sales have plateaued, if not declined a little bit, under the pressure of two things. You know, gas is, is getting to the point of being almost free, you know, in the United States, number one. And number two, the car makers themselves are saying that by, you know, 2018 model year, the 100-mile the range car will have a 200-mile range battery at the, at the same price. Well, you know, when a manufacturer tells you something like that, <laughs> That's great, but you've sort of discouraged sales, you know, for 16 and 17. And so I think, so we're, you know, we're, that's the, the valley that we're working through. Do, do you see a, a day in which uh, electric vehicles can provide grid services like frequency regulation? Yeah, we actually have an experiment going with PJM vehicle to grid. And we talked before, when we talked about energy storage, you know, and I expressed a, a mild hint of pessimism. It was about the idea of primary storage. To me, secondary storage, where we, if we can envision a country with 50 to 100 million uh, electric cars, and you know, um, it's not going to come as a surprise to you that if the average American car is driven 47 miles a day, that means it's sitting in repose 22 and a half hours a day. You know, the idea that those cars could all be connected to the grid and they could be feeding uh, for local voltage support, and again, in a, in a system that's relying a lot on distributed intermittent resources like solar. Uh, I mean, that, to me, that is the future. I mean, you know, it's going to be fiendishly complicated from a software perspective to make all that work together. But as a, a fundamentally distributed driven system, it's going to be a lot more resilient you know, in terms of, um, you know, big crises, you know, tree falls on a power line in Akron, Ohio, and the, the eastern United States goes dark for four days. Uh, I've, I've read that you own several electric vehicles. Is this true? And if so, which is your favorite? You know, so, yes, uh, I own five electric vehicles. Uh, because, and, and, you know, I have to tell you, once when I was in, like, way back when I was in my mid-40s, uh, you know, I said to my wife, it's, look, it's time for my midlife crisis. I said, you know, there's, there's two things a man does in his midlife crisis. He has an affair or he buys a sports car. And she said, well, how much would the sports car be? And I said, I said uh, probably at that time about $70,000. She goes, just have the affair, you know. So, so, so the only reason I have uh, electric cars uh, is because that's the only way I can get my wife to accept another car in the, in the driveway because I come home. And my most recent one, which is a really cool car, the BMW i8, and I bring that home and my wife's like, really? <laughs> and I'm like, hey, man, it's work. It's work. That's what I do for a living. I'm in the electricity business. So, uh, no, actually, uh, I'm actually, for a person who's got um, five electric cars, <clears throat> at least two of, three of which are sort of really cool looking sports cars, the i8 and in the, in the initial Tesla Roadster and the Fisker Karma. Um, I, you know, I'm actually not much of a car guy. I actually personally sort of prefer the Nissan Leaf because it's just a very straightforward car. You get in it, you know, I'm, I'm a tall guy. Those other cars, it's really hard to get down. Do you have yeah. a Volt? Uh, I do not have a Volt, so. Uh, here's a, uh a question on a topic on solar we didn't touch on. Could you speak to home solar versus commercial solar? Is uh, commercial solar should be much cheaper? Commercial solar. And I think commercial, I think maybe large scale, like utility scale solar. That's maybe the meaning of the question. 
Well, see, so this is the thing. I mean, utility-scale solar, I mean, I think that uh, they just had a bid. City of Austin did a utility-scale uh, bid, and they, they got bids four cents per kilowatt hour for utility-scale. I think in that case, Austin was providing the land, so, uh, but I don't know, but four cents, which is, you know, that's just insanely uh, cheap. But, you know, again, for the people who run the centralized system, and, and wind is even cheaper. I mean, wind is being bid. Big wind is being bid at two and a half cents, uh, but but they'll always show you. Okay, so that's the that's the cost of the generation. Then they ignore the fact that they're going to have to build these massive high voltage transmission lines to move it around uh, because the utility doesn't want to conflate those two expenses because they want to build the high voltage transmission line because they get rate based recovery on it. So. Uh, so utility scale is definitely cheaper. I mean, at that 350 a watt, um, you know, home solar is still, you know, 13, 14, 15 cents per kilowatt. But there's like 20 states where that actually works. I mean, maybe not 20 yet, but, and, and I can see the price, uh, because the great thing about beyond the meter distributed solar is that you're competing against the retail price of electricity, not the wholesale price. And there, your, your greatest asset is that you're competing against the greed of the utilities. Because you know, if, if you think about it, um, and I, again, I could be getting the numbers wrong, but it was something like in 2008, uh, natural gas prices peaked in 2008, and uh, Americans spent something like $250 billion buying natural gas in 2008. And I think by 2013, Americans spent $90 billion on natural gas for more natural gas. That $130 billion benefit, if it had been a government stimulus package, would have been the second greatest, biggest stimulus in the history of the United States. And yet you cannot find an American that benefited, thinks that they benefited from that $130 billion. And the main reason that they don't think they benefited is because they did not. Uh, because um, if you understand how rate-based regulation works, there's, depending on how close a, a, a utility is to their regulator, um, there actually is significant pressure on utilities not to raise rates, but there's almost no pressure on utilities ever to lower rates. And, and so, so one of the most shocking statistics to show you what monopolies do is from 2009 to 2014, when the single greatest input cost into the utility system, which is the price of natural gas, was going down, the rate of utility rate increase in the United States over the whole thing was going up in excess of the rate of inflation. Because what a utility will do is they'll go to the commission and say, you know, I want to spend you know, $5 billion on power lines, but don't worry, I don't have to raise rates because I'm taking the benefit from lower natural gas prices and moving it into this other part of my, my system. And, it, and it'll make the system more reliable. And that argument works. So, uh, so basically, uh, and you know, David, why? I mean, I got a natural gas line into my house in New Jersey. I don't know, and uh, and I know because I'm in the business. Natural gas is two dollars per million BTU. Why am I paying twelve dollars per million BTU? I mean, and that leads you to the question of um, there are 125 million homes in America. Uh, virtually all of them are have an electric line going into the home. There's 45 million American homes that also have a natural gas line. And, and you sort of say to yourself, or actually no one's saying this to themselves, but they should, why am I paying for these two expensive energy delivery systems into my house? Uh, because I'm not getting the benefit of these commodities. Because in both cases, the, the transportation and distribution systems are absorbing all the benefits of lower commodity prices. So why do I have these two? Well, well, one answer is because right now they serve different energy functionality in, in the houses. You know, gas is used for cooking and a couple of things. But if you could turn natural gas into electricity in your basement, you know, then you would get rid of one of those lines. And at least in the East Coast, you're not getting rid of your gas line because that's underground and that's not disrupted nearly as often as your electric line. And so. I don't know what the invention is going to be. I mean, there's a variety of different categories, but I think one of the things that's going to happen in the next three to five years is people are legitimately going to have the opportunity to tell their electric company, as people have been for the last 20 years telling their phone company, 
I don't need the fixed line phone anymore. I don't need an, I don't need an electricity provider. And, you know, and that's, of course, the big step in the death spiral because once that starts, because right now the death spiral is starting with people just are using less, less, less uh, electrons are going to go over the grid, but everyone's still going to be paying. And so the utility is like, oh, all I have to do is change my volumetric charging to fixed charging. But then when people start saying no and, and going offline, then the death spiral will accelerate quite dramatically. David, we are just about out of time. Let me ask you one final question. We're here at Columbia University. There's lots of students in the audience. Some of them are thinking about careers in the industry. Probably everyone would like a job at NRG. Um, so one qu uh, just broadly speaking, um, any advice for students in the audience? Uh, if you're thinking about a career in this industry, what, what should they be doing? Well, you know, one thing I, and look, I love, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And I, I love coming to Columbia. And um, the fact that, you know, seeing students interest in this field is incredibly invigorating uh, to me. And I would say one of the, the things that you have as an advantage in your generation, which we didn't have so much in our generation, is, is uh, you know, you, you have a fundamental disrespect for hierarchy, which is fantastic. Because uh, with the tools that you have at your disposal in your 20s and with the education that you've been given, and look, if you look at our generation of American leadership, about the only thing that we'll be able to write as an epitaph for ourselves is we educated the next generation, right? Because God knows we didn't solve the major issues of our time, like climate change, right? We, pat we kicked the can to you all, but we did educate you well. Uh, and so what I would say to all of you is like, um, you don't have to wait to make an impact, right? You don't have to, you know, go to work for, you know, an investment bank and be an analyst, then an associate, then go off to business school for two years and then go, or wait, it was analyst, business school, you know. You don't have to go through the thing, or as I did, go to a law firm, you have to do that for eight years, become a partner, which I couldn't do because I hated the law. But, uh, um, but you can make an impact right away. And what I would say to you is, in the energy space, I mean, obviously, uh, the end game, the goal, the societal goal that if, if you're in the right part of the energy space that you're, uh, is, you know, saving the planet. I mean, you have a, uh, the energy space, which is largely private sector, saving the planet so you can, you can serve a higher purpose and potentially make a billion dollars. You want to make a billion dollars while saving the planet? Who doesn't like that equation? While you're in your 20s. I mean, don't we all like that? I mean, I like the part about being in my 20s. But, uh, <laughs> And so what I would say is, as you think about a career, um, I was advising a young person the other day, and I was saying, well, I'm not a technology person myself, but if I was, you know, I would be working on carbon capture because the world needs it and someone's going to pay for it. Uh, I'd be working on our X Prize. If I, uh, you know, I think the other thing is that would excite me if I was much younger, I'd be going off starting up a company in Tanzania or something bringing distributed solar power into every village in East Africa. Uh, you know, once, uh, I, I think the opportunities there are immense. I just think there's, there's incredible opportunity um, and, and what you can do as you come out of this school, uh, you know, is like know what your skill is and find a job. I mean, sometimes people say to me, well, would, should I go work for the private sector like a company like you? Should I go into government? Should I work for an NGO? And I would say, uh, be impatient. Uh, there's, no, there's no clear thing, uh, government, NGO, uh, private sector. Uh, but just find a situation where you can have an impact sooner rather than later, because we need you all to have an impact sooner rather than later. It is totally obvious why David is such a widely admired and respected leader. David, thank you for joining us here at Columbia. Please join me in giving him a huge hand. <laughs> <laughs>